about today. I love the early service, and I slipped out of here trying to get to the men to find, and I missed it. And so if you missed it, don't feel bad. We're going to be having another one in two weeks, and you get to come. Any man that knows that God has a design for them in their life, and you want to know more about that, Brother Lorenzo is doing our men to defined class for our men. On Sunday mornings, we do man breakfast, uh, biscuits and gravy, hand sandwiches, all kinds of stuff. But we want you to come be a part. I truly believe that God is calling. So the Bible says, uh, raise up the mighty men. I tell you, guys, we have no idea the effect we have on your family, the effect you have on your job, the effect we have on our nation. Amen. So we need godly men to rise up. Amen. I'm about to jump right in. If you're visiting, what's to say? Thank you for coming. I know you didn't come for the preacher because um, we don't have that good of one. But you came to be in the presence of God, and man, nothing gets any sweeter. So uh, over the next few minutes, I truly believe God's about to do some great things. We are in a series called The House. Now, usually when you say the word house, you think of um, the house of God or your family house. Well, we've talked for weeks about the terminology of house encompasses a lot of things. Like, for example, it is, yes, the house is the house of God. But also the house is yourself. The Bible says you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Another translation says you house the presence of God on the inside of you. So you are a house. All right, Your family is a house. It's represented. If it, I don't care how big your family is. One, 15. It doesn't matter because like when you fill an application, it says household. Number and household, that representative of a house. Uh, the city, you know, it's, it's a city is recognized by its courthouse. And that's a, a governing place that runs the way a city happens. And the government, our government in the nation, is represented by our White House. And i got to be honest with you, if every one of these houses would take these principles that we've been teaching over the last several weeks and apply them, our nation would be in a different spot than what it is. You know, where, where our nation is, they're simply needing to do what the Bible says. Uh, last week we talked about a house of prayer. You know, the Bible says, if my people who are called by na my name will humble themselves and pray, if our nation would turn that way. The Bible says that God will hear from heaven and he will heal their lands. I mean, the answer to our issues is us becoming the house that God has called us to be. And I'm here to tell you, you say, Cricket, you know, I got people in my house not acting right. That's okay. You just become the house that God's called you to be, and you watch God get involved in your house. You know, and so today we're jumping into the topic of the house of His presence. I love it. We say it in here every week. Pastor Yvette does it in the pastoral offering blessing that we desire to be a house of His presence. Saying that, let me jump and make this PSA real quick. Uh, Thank you all that came out to work at the Camden campus yesterday. I am so excited what you guys have done there at that Camden campus. We have, you know, they've been out of their campus for 18 months because it first started with COVID. And then the devil did everything he could do to stop them from going back into that house. And the workload got heavy. It got daunting trying to, they, what they initially did, stepped in to try to, um, you know, fix and repair. When COVID happened here, uh, Wade and Misty came in and painted our house out. You know what I'm saying? And they painted everything but that one spot, and they left it for me. And you can see it's still not painted. <laughs> but I am going to get that spot. I am. But uh, um, we, we gave ourselves a facelift. But then um, Camden, they were going to go in and, you know, fix floors and change out carpet. But it turned into be a huge thing. Crews came in and messed things up. And for the last 18 months, they've been outside of their church on a stage on the parking lot. And rain or shine, they were there. And you know, what's amazing is, still in the middle of all that, God has grown the church. They have visitors every week. I mean, isn't that awesome? But so we stepped in a couple weeks ago. And Mike sends me a text. says, I'm, we need to get there and work. So we started working. And yesterday, we, jumped, we completed their stage, man. And you can't imagine how beautiful that thing is. Saying that to say this, we are going to have a victory homecoming. And uh, we're calling it homecoming because the Victory Campus is where all of the Victory Campuses started from. On November 7th, they're going to be back in their facility. And so we are actually going to do an early service here for those that can't make the trek. But then a 9 o'clock service here, but then we're going to do 
at 11 o'clock, we're going to the Camden campus, and we're believing, God, that all of our, all five of our campuses will be represented there in that service. The ramp, um, Karen Wheaton's ministry is going to be there hosting the service, and it's going to be an amazing service. But all five campuses are coming together, and we're going to have a huge picnic, barbecue afterwards. And so if you would love to see where we came from, it's 26 miles down the road. We won't, uh, we're turning out our late service the 1030 service, to go there to be there. We're going to do the service at 11, and uh, we will be taking our bus with you. So you say, well, do I got to drive? No, you just come here, and we'll take you. can ride the bus with us down. And so uh, you'll get to be a part of it, and they'll bring you back after you're full. All right, because after service, we're going to have a huge picnic and just celebrate how God has been. I told Dad, I felt it's like this. You know, when you read the story of Thanksgiving, how after a, you know, hard um, season, the Indians and pilgrims came together to give thanks and throw a feast on how good it got to been through them. I feel like that's this going to kind of be our COVID party. I think uh, not in a negative way. I think God has been faithful to all of our campuses through COVID. I mean, we're coming out. Numbers are dropping around the nation. We're still getting, keeping doing everything we can do to stay safe. We still fumigate the building. We still, I mean, we uh, kill all the virus, all the um, viruses and bacteria and things in our buildings and we still want to do hands up we're still being as safe as we can but at the same point i feel like we've made it through it amen god has been faithful there was one in five churches in the last 18 months closed their doors for good but god has been faithful i can say this from the elderated campus we've not lost a single member to covid during this season i am so thankful because it's not that the devil didn't try. If you're in here and you had COVID, you know it was a battle. But many of us were, you know, were hit and affected. And, but God he kept every one of them through. And my heart is heavy. We, in the Camden campus, we did lose one. We lost our first member a couple weeks ago to COVID. But my thing is this. God has been faithful to us all. And so I feel like we're going to have an early Thanksgiving on November 7th when we come together. Aren't you ready for an outside picnic? I'm ready for an outside picnic. The weather feels great, and so we're going there. So that's my PSA. We'd love for you to join us at our Camden campus. You'll get to um, meet the pastors of all the campuses. Um, you're going to get to see our pastors. Jerry and Elaine will be there. Dad will be hosting, and uh, Ramp's going to be ministering. And then we're all just going to party, all right? So it's going to be a great day, November 7th. Let's jump into today, the house of his presence. You know, the, very, the single most valuable resource on the planet Earth is not gold, although if you're a gold investor, you know you made a wise investment. I'm going to tie that real quick. Before I fall down in front of you guys. <laughs> yesterday, all right, so we were doing the Kilman Campus stage yesterday. I just got to tell you this. Mike and Wayne... Wade were over there working on the steps, and my mother had the most brilliant idea. They've covered their stage with black bamboo. Beautiful floor. And the walls are all, you know, they're, they're, and my mom had the brilliant idea. Man, these floors look good if we clean them with armor oil. And so I'm walking in, and all the ladies have been polishing this floor on this stage, and I come in, and Mom goes, Cricket, I found the best thing in the world that cleans this floor. I said, what's that? And she held up a bottle of armor oil, and then I realized I'm standing in the middle of the stage. And I look down. I mean, I'm you, it's like, it was like skating rink, ice, water. I mean, everybody, and if you'd have seen us working yesterday, me, Mike, Wade, every time we went across that, Miss Doris was the one spraying the armor all on the floor. <laughs> and we, we're all walking. You'd, you'd just be walking out of nowhere. You'd <laughs> like that. People were following. I said, Mom, there's better things than cleaning a bamboo wood floor than armor all. That thing was like a... They asked them, yeah, won't have any problem their praise team dancing the first Sunday in there because the thing is literally the slickest surface. I mean, wait a day, you just be standing there, you just can't stand still. It's, it's amazing, but long story short, I didn't want to fall in front of y'all today. People were falling yesterday. My mom fell off the stage yesterday, and, uh, but I told her it was her fault because um, she used armor all. Right? But get off that total. But So how did the single most greatest resource on the planet is not gold. Although if you invest in gold, you've seen the prices go up. Wise investment. You know, uh, you can invest in all kind of assets. Now, teaching um, in financial thought patterns, you know, the way you get rich or you grow in wealth is the secret to it is that you make sure that you always have more assets than you do liabilities. 
All right, if they say uh, they teach in economics that if you can have more assets than liabilities, then you grow in wealth and you on your journey to becoming rich. The problem with it is a lot of people don't understand the difference between an asset and a liability. A liability is something that you bought that costs you money. An asset is something that you have paid a price for or you have bought, but it makes you money. And the truth of the matter is a lot of times we can be causing our own self-harm by not understanding the difference in the two. For example, just a couple years ago, I had a vehicle that I had completely paid off. It was debt-free vehicle. And for about a year, I was running this vehicle, and it was still in good shape. Everything was good, but it was a Ford Expedition. And when a Ford Expedition, they're nice vehicles, a lot of room, but they are gas guzzlers. I mean, they will drink gas just for the fun of it. And so I did kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off, buying a new car because I was thinking, you know, I'm saving money. I don't have a car payment because this car's paid off. And so, you know, we just kept going and going, and I had to uh, pick up because I travel so much, and I don't want the traveling to be on people's backs. So I took on some uh, condo maintenance contracts, the truth be told, because I was spending a little over $700 a month on gas every month. And, you know, I had to pick up contracts of overseeing things to be able to pay for the fuel that I was putting in a car that was paid off. And I was thinking... Because this car was paid off, this was an asset. Until we sat down and realized what this car was actually costing me. Because it cost to go between the campuses weekly. It was running $150 because it was a big tank on thing. I'd fill up once coming from Alabama to here. And I'd have to fill up uh, when I got here and then fill up again halfway there going back. And it was a uh, drink. I was having to keep the oil changed, the maintenance on it. Man, this what I considered to be an asset was sinking me financially. But because my thinking about this asset was not right or right on, man, I was working my bottom off to try to keep, to save money driving this car. All right, well, when we, me and my wife sat down and did the figuring, we found out that, man, I'm spending a little over $700 a month on this vehicle. So we started shopping for new vehicles. So we, we figured out giving this car away that I think I'm saving money on to somebody else would actually save me money. And I went to a car and I bought a new truck. And the truck payment I got was $279 a month. It gets uh, 28 miles to the gallon. I could travel 520 miles a tank. And you know when I first got the truck, gas wasn't as high as it is right now. And so for $40, I could drive from here to Alabama $40 here and back, now it costs about $55 per tank, but I can still do the same. And saving the money on the $700 of just gas, now I, the, what I save, it pays the truck payment and the gas, and I still save a couple hundred dollars a month. All right, that's smart business. Although I was stupid about it for a long time. All right? A lot of times what we think is one of the greatest assets in our life. And so we put all of our energy, all of our resources, all our time and effort into it. You don't realize that there's a better way of doing it and there's a greater asset. And the truth of the matter is the greatest asset on this planet is you having the presence of God involved in your life. And what I mean by that is the presence of God is an asset. It is something that you can have. It's something that you can actually take and put and involve in your life and it will change everything else in your life. So today we're titling this the house of his presence. And I got to be honest with you. I don't care how well we do things at this church. You say, okay, y'all don't do these things very well. And I understand that because I'd rather be a house of his presence than a house of programs. So okay, y'all's programs don't run real strong. Y'all start. So I understand that. But my main focus in this house is not that our programs be the sharpest they can be. Now, I want them to be as sharp as they can be, so we do what we do, but at the same point, I'm more concerned as being a house of a presence of God than the house of a program that just runs and goes through the motions. I also, if this church had prefers to be a house of His presence, than to be a house of production. So, okay, you know, um, you guys uh, 
don't do as big a show. I understand that because it's important to us. We want to do things with excellence. But even above production, I want us to have the presence of God. Because if we have the presence of God, if, if God weren't involved in what we're doing, i got to be honest with you, you might as well go watch a movie. You might as well go to a ball game. You might as well go to a concert. Because if God and the presence of God is not a part of what we're in here doing, then you might as well just go be entertained by the world's best entertainers. Because that's all that's taking place. If you're not understanding that we're here not to be just gathering, but we're gathering together in His name. And because of that, the Bible says, God, where two or three are gathered together in His name, I will be in the midst of them. If you don't understand that's what we're doing, then you can take the greatest asset in your life and not get any benefit from it. So real quick, I want to break down the presence of God for us to be able to understand just a bit. Um, the Bible actually talks about uh, several different... Well, let me read this to you first. Look, can I just start off with a, with a um, scripture? Exodus 33, verse 12 said this. Then it says, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up these people. I love how Moses didn't call them my people because they weren't acting right at this point. Moses and God always, uh, those are your people. No, those are your people. Those are, those are, I do that a lot of times. I, you know, when the church is doing great, I said, look at our church. And when it's not doing good, I tell you guys, look at your church. All right, but uh, I'm going to be able to say, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that, is the, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. I love this promise. didn't say there's going to be a life without trouble. As a matter of fact, where they were being led was fixing to be full of enemies and battles. Matter of fact, this is where God's ultimate goal for them was to go into the promised land, and it was possessed, I mean, it was completely full of giants. But he said this when my presence is with you, no matter where and what you go to and through, you're going to find rest in this thing. Amen. I'm believing God at the end of the service. I didn't come up and pray over needs yet because I believe God's presence is going to be here today. I believe it is here today, and I believe that we're going to take advantage of it. So we're going to pray over needs here at the end of the service because. I believe there's some people that just need the hand of God and the presence of God working in their life to, man, just, you don't have to hold this thing together on your own. You're not just having to, you're not having to stress it. There is a place of rest for you. And the Bible says when you're, His presence is there, also you're going to have this rest that comes in. And, so, and then He said to them, if your presence does not go with us, this is most saying, if your presence doesn't go with us, do not bring us up from here. In other words, leave us in where we're at right now if you're not going to go with us because the things we're going to be facing and the things we're going to be going through, we're not going to be able to handle on our own. It would be best you leave us here than you not go with us even if we go to the promised land. And it said, For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except you go with us? So we, will, so we shall be separate." Your people and I from all the people of all the face of the earth. In other words, if you go with us, though, God, we'll be different than everybody else in the world. There will be a, a complete difference in who we are and how we do. And, you know, there, there will be obvious signs that we're your people because you're with us. It says, So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight. You know, I love the, 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 the word here. He says, it says, doesn't say you have found favor. doesn't say you have found, um, you know, my, you have pleased me. It says you have found grace. Do you know what the definition of grace is? Unmerited favor. They didn't do anything to do it. God just gave it to them. I want you to know something in here today. God has given you grace. You have found grace in God. I believe the enemy's trying to beat people up and make them think that they've not been good enough, they've not been smart enough, they've not been dedicated enough. You need to understand something. 
you, we will never live a life worthy of His presence if it weren't for the grace of God. None of us would ever get to experience the presence of God. So if you're here beating yourself up, you need to know something. I don't care how good you are the rest of your life. You're never going to earn the grace for His presence. But it says you have found. You know why you found it? Because He gave it to you. He gave it to you. And if you'll take the position of knowing that God has given you grace, then you're going to understand that the same way that He gives you grace you have available to you His presence. And it says this. It says, it says, You have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And He said, Please show me your glory. I want to talk real quick about the different kinds of presence that God talks about in the Bible. The first presence of God is it's called the omnipresent, or the omnipresence of God. It's one of His attributes. It's that God is everywhere all the time. Now, a lot of people, when you talk about the presence of God, that's the presence of God they go to. That God is everywhere all the time. And the Bible lets us know in Psalms 139 that, yes, that is true. Because David says, when I can go to, where can I go from your presence? I can go to the highest of the high, and you are there. I can go to the lowest of the low, and you are there. I can go to the top of the mountain, and you are there. I can go to the bottom of the sea, and you are there. You can go nowhere. Where can I hide from your presence? You can't. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. All the time. And there's two awesome things about that. One, that means you're never alone. You never have to worry. If, you know, Does God know what's going on in my life? Can God, is God seeing what's taking place? Yes, He's there. God's omnipresent. And also I love the fact that God being omnipresent means no matter how far you go, you're never out of the arm reaches of your God. And all of a sudden, that means when my kids get to acting crazy and they seem like they've gone so far from the way we've ta taught them and raised them that the hand of God can reach into it because He's there. There's nowhere in the world that you can go and be out of the presence of God. Now, the problem with the omnipresence of God is this, that you, whether you recognize it or not, He's there. But you still have the option of recognizing it or not. And this is the thing. The Bible says that, that uh, there's nothing impossible for God. All right? You can also say this. It's impossible for God to do nothing. And so whether or, never, whether or not you ever acknowledge the omnipresence of God, God has always been at work on your behalf to do good for you. Whether He's been up front in your life or whether He's been behind the scenes. And Him being behind the scenes or up front has been totally up to you. Whether or not you gave Him the acknowledgement to come in and permission to come into your life and be involved. But He's still, even if you haven't, He's been behind the scenes working on your behalf calling, pulling, moving, putting the right people in the right place to do the right, trying to get you to step, to allow him to step out of the shadows of your life and into your presence. The omnipresence of God is always working for your good. The Bible says God is good and he can only do good. But the thing about it is his omnipresence is everywhere. You need to know that. But then there's another presence of God called the, Elo, uh, the uh, Emmanuel presence of God. And that means God is with us. Jesus, when Jesus came, he said, he shall be called Emmanuel. God is with us. It was the first time since Adam and Eve that people were able to actually have a relationship with God face to face. Moses, now we'll talk about this in a minute. The Bible says there was a time when Moses was in the presence of God and he talked to God face to face, mouth to mouth as a friend talks to a friend. But only very few people got to experience that in the Bible times until Jesus came. And when Jesus came, he didn't say, I'm only going to be with a few. I'm going to be with you all. And so we now have the presence of God to where we can have a personal relationship with Jesus. Let me explain it to you like this. God is everywhere all the time. Before I met Jen, um, me and Jen, after we met, we had found out that because she was very actively in church and I was working in the ministry, me and her had been at several places at the same time over the years. Different youth conventions, different you know, um, concerts and all those kind of things. We were both at the same place, but we did not know each other. It wasn't until me and her one day met up here at Applebee's and she came down and sat at the table that I was at because I'd come and sit down to hang out with my brother and we locked eyes with each other and we fell madly in love at that moment and then for the next three months, I ran, and she chased me down and finally got me to... No. 
you can be in the same presence of God and not have a Elo, uh, an Emmanuel relationship with Him. Just because you're occupying the same space does not mean that there's a relationship involved. See, there's a, not only is God everywhere all the time, there's also a presence of God where you can know Him, you guys can communicate together, and you have a personal relationship. Now, what's amazing about that relationship is that relationship begins to produce things in your life simply by you having it. For example, I don't like kids. The reason why I have kids because I like my wife a whole lot. <laughs> and that's what happens when you like a wife a whole lot. When you start building a relationship and that relationship goes into intimacy, the truth is if, if it's a guy and a girl, there's going to be fruit born. You can't have a relationship with Jesus without fruit coming out of your life. And as you begin to have this relationship with the a personal presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, the Bible says fruit begins to grow. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. This stuff starts coming out. And you know, i got to be honest with you. We weren't trying to have kids, but we had them. What we did is we just had a relationship together in the presence of one another. A lot of people are trying to have a relationship with God, but they're never willing to get intimate with Him. And so they never get intimate with the presence of God, so they're wondering why their life is not producing fruit. The Bible says this in, his, in a, a, um, Exodus, it says that when Moses got ready to meet with God, it says he went outside the tent and he put up a tent outside the camp. And he put this tent up outside the camp, and then he named it the Tent of Meeting. And it says that he would get up, and when he, was, when he wanted to go and spend time with the presence of God, he would go outside of the camp, outside of busy life, outside of all the other relationships that he had going on in his life, and he had to go out to this, this place that was not convenient. If you're wanting the personal, the, the Emmanuel relationship of the presence of God in your life, you're not going to get to be casual and just go through life and get it. The Bible said he had to go outside of his daily, daily life and have this place and this time that he would, the Bible says the cloud of God would come and sit on the tent of meeting and he would go inside that tent of meeting. Now, he didn't do it alone. The Bible says that Joshua would go in there with him and it says when Moses would get up and leave, Joshua would stay. It says even after Moses departed. See, you get to decide how close and how deep that relationship with the Emmanuel you have. And you need to know something though. When God is for you, who can be against you? And if you're not, if God is with you, I want you to know something. He's for you. Now, this relationship with God, this presence of God in your life, God wanted you to have so bad, He's already jumped all the hurdles for you to have it. He went a lot farther to be with you than we have to go to be with Him. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he was willing to pay the ultimate price, his son. Because what he sees you as, is an asset, not a liability. See, if you don't understand the two, you will look at somebody and you'll think, look how much they're costing me. And you'll put up with them. But when you look at somebody as an asset, You'll say, you know, this might have cost me this much, but man, look at what all I get out of that. There's a difference. And gee, God doesn't look at you and say, look what all I did for him. Look at all I paid for him. Look, God says, man, if he only knew the value I see in him, he would understand that I would have paid anything and I did. See, what makes something valuable is what you're willing to pay for it. the nicest piece of property you've ever seen, but it's only worth what somebody will pay me for it. Value is not set by economics or because the truth of the matter is you can have a house that the comps say is worth 300000 but if nobody's willing to pay that, it's not worth that. God looked at you and said, you're worth this to me. And he paid it. What happens with this Emmanuel presence of God, a lot of us look at 
him that presence being in our life, we're saying, oh, that's a little bit much to pay, and so we're not willing to pay. So we don't get the assets that come along with it. Then there's another presence of God. And it's called the Shekinah glory or the Shekinah presence of God. Now this presence is different than just the God with us relationship presence. This is the actual presence of God that can be seen, that can be felt, and that has the power to change anything. And see, a lot of times we read in the Bible and we see people experiencing this presence of God and we think that would have been so super cool to get to see God do that. Well, you got to understand, those that got to see God do that were those that understood the value of what that was and they paid the price to have it in their life. Because God does not change. His Shekinah glory is still available for us today. The problem is you have to understand the value of this glory. The value of this presence. And so I want to talk just a little bit about what that presence is. Because I'm here to tell you, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if there's ever been a time that, you know what I'm saying, this presence is available to you, this is now as much as ever. And I believe, the Bible says, in the last days, I'm going to pour my spirit out upon all flesh. I believe we have the opportunity and the ability to see this presence of God at work in our lives more than any other time in history. This presence is represented a lot of places in the Bible. One of the places is when they came up to Mount Sinai. The children of Israel came to Mount Sinai. And the Bible says the presence of God came and sat on the mountain. And it says fire and smoke came down. You say they were seeing this. Yeah, they were seeing this. But the Bible says they were also feeling it too. The earth began to shake. And the presence of God, the Chicano presence of God... Is such an amazing thing that people were afraid of the power that was involved in it. The Bible says that the children of Israel, it, it, it frightened them at such a point that they built barriers at the bottom of the mountain to keep themselves safe the presence of, from the presence of God. But the truth was this. It was keeping them out of the presence of God. Because if they would have understood what was on that mountain, they would have done like Moses. They would have climbed that mountain to the very top. And they would have been transformed and changed. This presence of God, and you, you can have it actively involved in your life to where you can feel it, you can see it, and it will affect the world around you. So, Craig, I've never seen smoke and fire come down. Have you ever been sitting in a service and you got the goosebumps? Yeah. ever done that? I've already had it twice in here today. That's why I know there's not just an omnipresence of God in here. I also know there's not just a personal relationship or presence of God in here. I know the Shekinah presence of God is in here because I truly began to feel it. Let me just ask this question. How many guys have felt or you know, had some kind of acknowledgement that there was a presence in here bigger than you? All right? I want to break some stuff down today because I want everyone to understand what you have available to you and for you. So those are the presences of God. Now let me tell you why the presences of God are so important in your life because the presences of God always have privileges and always have rewards. When you are aware and acknowledge and allow the presence of God to work in your life, there's privileges that come along with it and there are advantages in life that you will get that other people won't. All right, the first one I want to talk to you about is found in Genesis 39, verse 2. And this is what it says. Now, the Bible is so full of men and women that understood the greatest asset in their life was not money in the bank, job, car you drive, business you own. The greatest asset in their life was the presence of God in their life. Because I'm telling you, if anything that you have gotten or you own or possess... With, that you got without the presence of God being involved, you're going to eventually lose it. There's no sustaining force in this thing. You say, well, man, I built a business and it's going to take care of my family. Do you know 90% of families that build businesses and create wealth, the third generation has lost it all? But see, when David 
was encounter with the presence of God. And he valued the presence of God so much in his life. The Bible says that God was going to be with every one of his descendants from now. And there would always be one of his descendants sitting on a throne. You want to build a legacy? You build with the presence of God involved. Because anything you build without God will not last. And so when people understand the greatest age, and you say, okay, I don't have a big business to build. I tell you what, you pursue the presence of God and you involve the presence of God in your life, it's only a matter of time before you do have something like that. Because the Bible says, if I'll seek first the kingdom of God, all these other things will be added into me. The greatest asset in my life is the presence of God. And I get to decide at what level it is involved in. I can let just God be omnipresent and he can just be everywhere I go. I can just take him and be with me and him being with me, who can be against me? Or I can actually let the Shekinah presence of God be a, have such a part of my life that everywhere I go, the power of God is working on my behalf and shifting and moving and shaking and touching and changing people in every direction I go. You know, I love the fact that God doesn't just want to be around me. The Emmanuel presence, it doesn't do things outside me. It does things on the inside of me. Healing, making, developing. But the Shekinah presence wants to do everything around me for His glory. And they're all available to us. But the first reward is Genesis 39 verse 2. And it says this, And the Lord was with Joseph. It says, and he was a prosperous man. That's awesome right there. Because you know the, the first reward or privilege of the presence of God in your life is prosperity. Now, I'm not talking about rich. Uh, prosperity is way more than rich. Actually, the word prosperity means excel and expanding. All right? So it says that the Lord was, because you need to understand, read the rest of that scripture. It says, the Lord was with Joseph and he was prosperous, but it says he was still a slave. Look what the presence of God can do for you. You can still be in circumstances that are not completely in your favor, but God be in this thing with you, and you be blessed and prosperous all the way around. See, the presence of God is what changes your situation. Your situation doesn't have to change before you can say that God did something for you. You can be right in the middle of a bad marriage, have God involved in it, and you, God begin to prosper you in a marriage, you end up with the best marriage you've ever had in the world. You can be in a business. You can be in a job. i, I got to be honest with you. I've had jobs, and I've made six figures. I was making well over 100000 before I got married to Jennifer. And I'm going to tell you, nearly every month my accounts were negative because I just did not really know how to handle money. When I married Jennifer, I made less than 30000 a year. She was very stupid. I'm just saying, people want to know which one of us is smarter. Look who we married. All right. But because she understood how to work money and things like that, I made 30000 a year, and I had more money in my bank account after our first year of marriage than I did all the years before I was making six figures. Why? Because some people know how to handle things better than we do. And when you allow the Holy Spirit and the presence of God involved in your life, you need to understand something. He can do things with what you have that you had no idea could be done. He can... Hey, you need to understand God, is a, his, his nature is to be a filler. Anything you give God space to fill, He fills. All right? you, it's like the pot of oil, filled it with oil. You know, the uh, baskets to feed the people. He broke the bread and made it multiply. See, the, one of the first rewards of having the Prince of God involved in your life is, man, your life instantly starts going prosperous and excelling. Look in... Uh, the same chapter, 21st verse, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph, and he showed him mercy. Man, I tell you what. I love that how this is. We get in our minds a lot of time when you read the story of Joseph that this guy lived perfect. And that's why God was able to bless him the way he was. You need to know something. He was not blessed the way he was because he was perfect. Because why would he need mercy? It said, the Lord was with him and gave him mercy. I am so thankful that my life is not dependent on me making all the right choices and all the right decisions. 
my life, really the success of my life will determine whether or not the presence of God is involved in it. Because I'm here to tell you, I mess up every single day. But I'm so thankful that I'm smart enough to know that even though I blow it, I may deserve a lot of things. But I'm so thankful that because the presence of God is in my life, I don't get what I deserve. He gives me something I don't deserve. And His mercy is at work in my life. Because even though I may have the best intentions and the best plans to do the best thing I can do, I still, like Paul says, that thing I don't want to do, I do. And that thing I do want to do, I don't. And I find myself blowing it all the time. But God is so still good to me because He's with me. And it says, He gives me mercy. And then check out what this says. It says, and, and, um, and He gave him favor. Even though He was blowing it. Because the presence of God was in his life, there was favor that set on him. It says he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Again, his circumstances were not that good. But because God's presence was in his life, the worst of the worst situation, God was pouring favor in. When you have the presence of God in your life, then what happens is favor begins to come into situations that you would seemingly think impossible. Bosses actually like you. You know, a mate, i got to be honest with you, I look in the mirror all the time, and the fatter I get and the more hair I lose, I think, how in the world could Jennifer love me? I can tell you this, it's only because I'm saved. <laughs> For her to keep loving me. So you got into the favor of God comes from the presence of God and the mercies of God. And then look in Daniel chapter 3. Verse 25, it says, And he answered and said to them, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the first is like the Son of God. What is another advantage of having the Prince of God in your life? Protection and immunity. If you've ever lived in a day you need immunity, now's the day you live in it. I know, I, I'm here to tell you, I travel a lot. And I, I do job not just for me. I'm in jobs in different places and different states and that weekly. And I'm here to tell you, I've not caught COVID yet. And, you know, the way I know it, you say, well, you may have had it. And you, I take a COVID test every Monday morning because I don't want to take COVID into my family. And then I don't want to take COVID maybe there back into the church. So I test every week. And I've, over the last 18 months, I've had all negative tests. And I say, you say, well, cricket, you know, does that mean that if I got COVID that the presence of God was not with me? No. You walked right through that fire and you came out. You walked to the valley of the shadow of death and God was with you because you're still here today. I, I told the early service, me and Joyce and Yvette sat in a restaurant, you know, and we were dipping chips in the same salsa bowl, eating chips for two hours. And a couple of days later, she had COVID and I didn't. But she came out of COVID. We didn't lose her there. I'm telling you, if you've ever needed the presence of God in your life, you need the presence of God for the protection and the immunity that we have to have to live in. If you knew over the last couple of years how many, the traveling and the different things that the, I would go by and see car wrecks and think, how in the world could that have happened to them? I, I, there was, I saw one a few years ago like I'd never seen before. There was a car wreck, and the cars, I'd never seen this before. There was a, the car and the wrecks were so bad, they didn't send ambulances. There were three hearse. I took a picture of it. There were three hearse there getting the people out of the cars, not ambulances. That's the worst wreck I've ever seen. And I've seen wrecks weekly. And you know, I've, I was told the early service this morning that you know, there was a time that I was, I was, we were driving and I had my kids in the car coming to a service and we stopped at a gas station and there was a U-Haul truck parked in front of the gas station. And the guy was, I was parked behind him waiting for him to go and man, 20 minutes into it, he still hadn't went. So I was starting to get all mad and all upset and all aggravated, griping. And Jennifer's like, Cricket, you need to just calm down. So says, you know, this ain't worth you costing what God's wanting to do this weekend. And so I, I calmed down. I, said, I took my correction well. And so <laughs> I calmed down. And the truck went on and went. And we pulled up and got gas. 
and we didn't get down the road five minutes and there was a gas truck tanker flipped over on its side and it exploded and the gas had burnt on the side of the highway, both sides of the trees on both sides. And it happened, the cops weren't even there yet, just people were pulling up and watching. And that could have been me and my family 20 minutes before sitting beside that vehicle because the presence of God involved in your life causes a protection that what other people, the Bible here says, says that the children of Israel, I mean, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego walked through a fire and it didn't burn them. But you say, well it, was, well, it wasn't really fire. Well, there were two people that even got close to it that didn't make it. The guards were killed just by getting close. I'm telling you, there's a, if you look back in your life, everybody in here could probably say there was a time that you do not deserve to be alive and you don't know how you made it through it, but I'm here to tell you, it was because the presence of God was at work. The presence of God, the benefits. The Bible says, If he that dwelleth in the secret place of Moses shall abide under the shadow. It says you can tread upon the lion, the adder, the young lion, dragon. Can you trample under your feet? There is a protection that comes out of Dad, The same presence that was in the lion's den is the same presence that was in the fire. Is the same presence that's available to you. 1 Samuel chapter 18 says this. It says, And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him. That's amazing to me that a, a shepherd boy was feared by a king. But let me explain to you why this is the way it is. Read the rest of that scripture. It says, it says, And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Saul knew what it was like to have the presence of God with him. And he knew David had that same thing that he once had before. What does the presence of God bring? It brings reverence and honor into your life. Most of the time, when I'm dealing with people, I don't like to tell people I'm a pastor because the minute I tell them I'm a pastor, they start acting different. I was at a party the other day with my wife's real estate uh, firm, and we were going with this young couple who had just gotten saved this year. And so Jennifer works with her, but their marriage is really, they, they came to God because they were in desperate need of it. And so the... the uh, Jennifer and her said, I'm not going to tell my husband that your husband's a preacher because I don't want him to be worried about acting right or whatever. And so she didn't. And so I was there and I knew that Jennifer hadn't told him that, or they hadn't told him I'm a preacher. And so, ma'am, it was the funniest thing. You could tell she told him how to act when they got there because I was sitting there talking with him. And when the, Jennifer and her would walk up, he wouldn't cuss. The minute they walked away, Man, he couldn't. It was rattling all that letter. But when they would walk up, he'd stop. And we, you know, that up. So he was watching how he was acting around her. But he had no idea what I was. Or I would have never seen the real him. Does that make sense? And so he would, it's, they, people as a pastor, when people find a pastor, they do act different. But I'm here to tell you this. Just the title alone, they have an idea that you're a, you've got God in your life. And you got, so people, but I'm here to when the presence of God is in your life, your enemies, the Bible said, will even be at peace with you. Do you know why? Because they're scared to death that if they cross you, there's somebody bigger behind you that's going to take care of it. I've had my enemies bless me in my life before, not because I'm a preacher, because honestly I introduce myself as a contractor more than I do a preacher because I don't want people to change the way they behave around me. I need to know who's saved or not and who I need to witness to. But if they know you're a preacher, everybody's saved. So it's a long story short. People will long to, the Bible says that you know, it will even make your enemies at peace with you. When a man's ways please the Lord. Numbers chapter 17 to me is the greatest benefit of the presence of God that you can have. It picks up in the story in the children of Israel where Aaron was about to be chosen the high priest of the people. This is what it says about him. The way they chose him was it wasn't because he was Moses' brother. Wasn't because he had been involved in more events with God, dealing with God up to that point. It was what they did. They took all 12 tribes of Israel. They took the leader of each tribe and they put it before the Lord. They all took a walking stick and they took it into the Holy of Holies and they laid these walking sticks on the ground in front of the Ark of the Covenant, which at that time held the presence of God. And in one night... Everything changed. 
You need to understand something. When you're in the presence of God, it don't take but one dark season for the presence of God to begin. Theologians believe this. When the Ark of the Covenant was... If we don't got time to go into the design of it all, but you know, God couldn't be Emmanuel yet. So he desired so much to have his presence involved in their lives. He said, I'll live in a box. And so he got in this box that was built. It was called the Ark of the Covenant. Now, inside this box, there were three things. One, there was a bowl of manna. You need to know something. When the presence of God is in your life, you don't got to worry about you taking care of all your needs. God said, I will provide all your needs according to my riches and my glory. In his presence, there is provision for you that you can't even understand. The Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, not even entered into the thought of man, the good things that God has in store for us. You worry about your bills? I tell you, you worry about the presence of God and your bills will be taken care of. And so, not only there, there was these tablets that were called the Ten Commandments, had the law of the Lord written on it. What is that saying? When you are in the presence of God, the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. There will be a supernatural power with the presence of God in your life that you can say no to sin that you can't say when the presence of God is not involved in your life. It will give you supernatural power to do things you could never do. It's seen perfectly in the life of Samson. Samson, when it says, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he took a jawbone of a donkey and killed a thousand men. Virtually impossible. I mean, you couldn't do that. Had the presence of God not to come on his life. You can't, you say, Cricket, I can't quit sinning. Man, you focus in on the presence of God. Quit focusing in on trying to just do right. And you let the cup get clean by the presence. That's what he says he'll do. But then there was that staff, and this is the story of the staff. They took this staff. Theologians believe, you know, the ark, the angels on the side of the box, that in between it glue a, a blue light. Now, there's no proof of this. Oh, theologians just believe that illuminated the area where the presence of God sit. Because in the tabernacle, it was the outer courts where the sun was there. You go into the inner courts, and there was a lampstand that gave light. But in the Holy of Holies, there was no light. It was a dark space. But the presence of God brings forth such light, allows you to see in areas and see things that you could never see on your own. But the Bible says they took those 12 walking sticks and they walked in and they laid them before the Lord for one night. And you got to understand what that walking stick was. A walking stick was a tree that at one point was planted into the ground that's roots went into the soil and had a source of nutrients and life to draw from. But psh, this stick got cut off from its life source. There was nothing in this stick now or connected to this stick that could put life back into it. So what did that stick do? It died. Not only did it die, the next thing they did was they stripped it of all of its bark. And they stripped it. And so now that stick is vulnerable. Bark on a tree is there to protect it from, you know, the insects and parasites. It's just protected but it got stripped from all of that. So now it's dead and vulnerable. Then to get a walking stick, they have to take it, and they would, it was a shepherd's step, so they bent it over, and they would take a rope and they would bind it to hold its shape. And so now we've got a life that's been cut off from a life source, and it's been stripped and been abused through all kind of treatment, and now it's found itself bent, warped, and bound, addicted not in control of its own life anymore. It's going to be shaped the way the binding wants it to be shaped. And then it's laid out in the sun and dried, forgotten about, and just left there. And when it's been there and left there long enough, they'll come and take it and they'll untie the binding. And it's been through so much now, it holds its shape. And now it's just become a tool for somebody to use. But they took this stick... And they laid it in the presence of God. And in the presence of God that night, a life source came out of that spot that went back into a stick that had no way to live again. And life began to flow. And out of flowing it, it began to sprout leaves. But it wasn't just enough leaves that God, it began to become fruitful. The Bible says it produced buds and fruit. 
a life now that had no way of producing a future, no way of producing you know, fruit and having any hope of anything ever being any different. The presence of God transforms a stick and makes it live again. The benefits of the presence of God in somebody's life is, you say, well, Cricket, there's no way my marriage will ever bear fruit again. You get in the presence of God. You say, well, Cricket, there's no way that my job, I'm always going to be in this dead-end job. You get in the presence of God. And what never could live again will begin to sprout. And not just sprout, but spring forth life. The presence of God can change everything. But I got to tell you that I got to tell you, we're done. But I got to tell you, I don't want to tell you all about the presence of God without telling you how to get it. Because there's a protocol, there's a map, there's God's given us a clear plan on how to not just hear about the presence of God, not just read about the presence of God, but actually experience and live with the presence of God. Not just the omnipresent, not just the personal relationship, but actually the Shekinah presence of God actively at work in your life. And the first thing is, number one, it has to be welcomed. God's not going to force His way into your life. Now, He may encounter you, but if you push Him away, He'll take a step back. God's always working behind the scenes to have an encounter with you, just like He did with Paul. Paul was running down the road, blinded him. And if Paul wanted to go back doing what he was always doing, he could have. Just like Peter, when Peter screwed up bad enough, he decided, I'm just going to go back and fish again. But God still hunted him down on that beach. You can push God away. But you want the presence of God at work in your life? You want the Shekinah? Then you have to make sure it's welcome. God's a filler. He'll fill any space you give Him. He'll fill any life you let Him. And so number two, you gotta, He's not just got to be welcome. You've not just got to want it. He's got to be invited. We have not because we ask not. When you get up every day and you start saying, God, I want you to go with me everywhere I go. See, for a long time I wouldn't want to ask that because I might go somewhere that day that I didn't really want Him to be there with. You need to see some stuff, you know. And, but the truth was, he was already there. He's got to be invited. It takes a prayer life. You're not going to have the Shekinah presence of God without there being a prayer life involved. And we talked about that last week. Number three, he's got to be valued. You've got to value this thing. Because when you value something, you protect it. I value my wife. That's why I don't have relationships with other ladies like I do with my wife. Because that wouldn't be me valuing her. And anything I don't value, I don't protect. Then, and prepared for means if you're going to come to my house, I get ready for you to come to my house. I go get food, or I don't wait till you get there and be like, I ain't got nothing to eat, so uh, what do you want to do? You know, I prepare for it. And then number four, you got to acknowledge. you got to give attention to. The Bible says in Psalm 16, it says, come on up, Leah, if you don't mind. We're going to create an atmosphere real quick. Psalm 16 says this, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures evermore. This one scripture shows the three different presences of God. I get to choose how active I am in all three of them. You will show me the path of life. That's omnipresent God always working in and for you to try to make life work in His direction. It says in your Presence is fullness of joy. That's the Shekinah. It says, at your right hand, you give me pleasure there more. That's the relationship. But if I want to have those things, it's going to take a hunger. Everybody say hunger. David said this, as the deer panted for the water, so my soul longs for you. David said this, Lord, take anything from me, but don't take your presence. Because he knew that he was nothing without the presence of God. And anything he built without it would fall flat in life. There are usually reasons why people go after the presence of God. Like David says, he says, as the deer panted for the water. There's four reasons why deer pant for water. If you're a deer hunter in Arkansas, you know, you know, when you shoot a deer and you don't kill him, he's just wounded, he begins to bleed out. If you're anywhere around a water source, as that deer is running, bleeding out, they're going toward a water source. You don't know how many times, because I'm not a real good shot. After I pulled the trigger, we would have to start walking toward the creek because <laughs> I knew that's where he was headed. And we, there's many times I found them laying there right on the side of the creek with their head in the water because there's a lot of people that don't understand the value of the presence of God until they've been hurt or they've been wounded. And the pain don't stop 
Nobody can make it go away until they get to the presence of God. But that's not just the way God wants you to live. Pursuing the presence of God when you've been hurt and you've been bruised and wounded. Another reason why deer will run after the water is because life is busy. And you're hustling, hustling, hustling. And you're hustling, sorry, you're sweating and getting through life. that You get real thirsty and so then you have to stop and go find something to drink. There's some people that don't understand the presence of God because they're so busy in their life that until they get to the point of dehydration, they're not going to take time to allow God to get involved. Then there's the presence of God that in Africa, there's this weird deer that's got a nostril and his nostrils grow up. He's got two little, his nostrils are on top of these two little things. And what it is, is when a predator cat gets after them, they take off running toward the water. And so when they get to the water, if they can get to the water before the cat gets them, they can jump down in the water and they stick there. They're fully submersed and they can still breathe completely under the water. And the cats don't get in the water. So it becomes a safety mechanism for them. There's some of us that don't get thirsty until the devil comes after us. Those are called foxhole Christians. When life starts falling apart, we try to get to God for help and safety. But I'm so thankful that He's willing to do that. But then there's another reason why deer will pan after water. I'm a, I have a contract license. I do a lot of contracting work. And there's a lot of days we'll be working hot, doing all kind of stuff. And you'll get to this point where you'll be like, you know what? Man, I'm so thirsty. And somebody say, hey, you want a Coke? I don't want a Coke. I want water because there's nothing like water. Nothing tastes as good as water. You know what I'm saying? And so there's people that do it. But then there's another reason why deer will drink water. And they don't have to get to the point of panting. They can recognize that you can only live if you have water. As a matter of fact, they say you can live 40 days without food. You can only live three days without water. And if you can know that, then you know that you will never be able to live without the presence of God in your life. We were created like fish. We were never meant to be out of His presence. But we blew it. We got out. Adam messed it up and we were put out. And God did everything He could do to get back, get us back in. But the bowl now is available. But we get to choose whether or not we want to lay on the floor and flop and flip and go without God or we can get back in His presence. And in His presence, the Bible says, there's fullness of joy. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Life changes when you live in the presence of God. You've all experienced people that have done it. You would would see somebody walk into life and things just worked for them. You've been in a room where somebody would walk in. I've been in a place where I would be and somebody would walk in. And it's like when they walked in, so did the presence of God. And they changed the room. These are people that have learned the value of the presence of God and how great of an asset it is. But see, what happens is we can see the value. And so we pursue so hard in life to get the value. And so it's said like this. So many of us live our life wanting to pursue the presence, the little boxes wrapped up in gifts. And so we will chase after the presence. We want our stuff to get better. We want God to do this for us, God to do that for us. And we don't understand that if we go after the presence, the space He wants to occupy in your life, He brings the presence with Him. And everything that you need, everything that you want, everything that you've been battling, everything that's been defeating you becomes His issue. And you focus on Him. He'll focus on everything in your life to make it work. Most of us go through life not understanding that the healthiest life you can live is to get up every day and drink a bottle of water. The doctors will tell you, you get up every day and drink a a bottle of water, you'll be healthier through that day than you can be any other way. Instead of waiting until you're so thirsty that you're not going to make it another step until you get a drink. The presence of God is available. And I'm here to tell you this. You have to be willing to pay for it. You say, Cricket, how do I pay for it? Well, this is what the Bible says. God lives in atmospheres. He lives in atmospheres. 
Bible says where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. It says God inhabits the praises of his people. I get to decide whether or not the presence of God is welcome into my life by the atmosphere that I create. The Bible says there's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. If I choose to live in sin, I can count on the presence of God not being actively involved in my life. Righteousness. Peace. If I become a man of war and I have strife and fight with everybody and everything, and oh, that's just my personality. No, if I allow that to be my personality, I create an atmosphere of righteousness and peace. I can tell you this. I can, when me and my wife are going at each other, and yes, we do that, because we're both very strong personalities, and you know, she hadn't realized I'm the smartest person on the planet yet. So we will be going at it, but I'm telling you, I can feel the presence of God leave our house. Because, see, God gave, I, the Bible said David wanted to build a place for the presence of God. He wanted to build a tavern, but God said, you can't do it, David, because you're a man of war. He said, but you can get everything ready so your son can. But because David was a man of war, he couldn't build a place for the presence of God. Although he valued the presence of God so much. If you're not willing to choose to get, you know, I can be 100% right and still be 100% wrong. I can tell Jennifer something factually, 100% right. But if I do it without love, I'm 100% wrong. And the atmosphere of the way I do things can determine whether or not the presence of God and the power of God can work. Then not only does the atmosphere matter, than the sensitivity I am to that atmosphere. I learned this traveling. I can walk into an airport sometimes and I can have a, a um, dollar in my pocket go right through a metal detector and not make a sound. I can go to another airport and have the same dollar in my pocket go through the metal detector and go beep, beep, beep. I've been through airports sometimes. It's like they almost made me completely strip down for me to get to them stupid air. Uh, uh, Metal detectors. And so I asked the guy one day, what's the difference? Why, why can I get, go in one airport and not cause an issue? Because They said because every airport has a TSA agent, a TSA supervisor. And he is the one that is, has the permission to set the sensitivity to the metal detector of that airport. So they're not all the same. And this is what it tells me. That the sensitivity level that I decide to carry in my life has the power to let in my life what I want to. Some airports let more things in them than others do, which is crazy because, you know, uh, there's a man in charge of letting things in airports. All right, that's pretty crazy. And they get to choose how sensitive. The Bible says that I, can, I have to set my affections on things that are above. I have to set my sensitivity to what God's doing. Like a while ago, I felt goosebumps. And I could have ignored that or I could have recognized that that's the presence of God in this room. And if God's in this room, you need to know God don't show up anywhere without Him wanting to do good. Everywhere Jesus showed up in the New Testament, He either healed, raised from the dead, delivered, blessed, fed, set free. Anytime God shows up anywhere, it's impossible for Him to do nothing. So what allows God to do things in my life is the sensitivity that I set whether he's there or not. If I ignore him, I can be... I told you the story about the one stick. Do you know what I believe... What I didn't mention is the 11 other sticks that laid in the same place the same night and didn't do anything. You can be in the very presence of God and you don't be sensitive to it. And you can walk out of here exactly the same. When someone else's life completely changes and begins to prosper and flourish again, why? Because you get to set the dial on how aware. And you say, well, Cricket, how do I do that? It's the actions that you take. If God is here, then you begin to move into the presence. The Bible talks about the presence of God being like water, ankle deep, knee deep. But you get to decide how tangible and powerful the presence of God is. When they went up the mountain, everyone stayed at the bottom. Seventy went up to the bottom of the smoke. Moses and Joshua went a little higher. But it says Moses went to the top. And when he came down, they could not even look at him. For the glory of God had transformed him into something that everyone was afraid. 
The presence of God is so actively at work in our life, but we get to decide how active it is in our life. God hasn't changed. He said, and this is, I said all this today to say this one thing in this service. That's a lot, Greg. Out of all the messages of the house I've been preaching, this is the only one I felt like the Lord gave me a prophetic word over. And so I don't know who this is for, but I'm here to tell you a prophetic word in your life. You've got to go to Isaiah 43 in verse 1. It says, But now thus saith the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. Somebody needs to know that you are His. He cares. And He counts you valuable. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. You are valuable to Him. He sees your value. You're an asset. And He's saying this, if you'll make me, me your asset, you're going to go through this water and you're not going to be hurt. You're going to go through the rivers and they shall not overflow you. This thing that's trying to push you down will not push you down. This thing trying to overrun you will not overrun you. It says, and though you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. God is saying He's with you. He's for you. He knows what you're going through. But He's also saying this. You're the most valuable asset He has. But if you will see that He's the most valuable asset you have, and you will let Him go through this thing with you, you will make space, you will put effort, you will do what it takes for Him to be involved. You're going to come through this thing not even smelling like smoke. Do you receive it? I don't know who it's for, but I'm telling you, God said, I'm with you. Value my presence. Become a house of His presence. He will fill whatever space you give Him. This is what we're going to do. For the next three minutes, the Bible says God inhabits the praises of His people. Over the next three minutes, Miss Leah is going to lead us in praise. Create an atmosphere for the presence of God to shake your world, to change your situation, to put His glory on you and even change the appearance of what you came in here looking like. And let the presence of God go out and change every part of every circumstance and every situation. But if you need prayer, you say, Cricket, I desperately need the power of God at work on my life. I want our prayer leader to come up and be in the altars. And I want where two or three are gathered together in His name. There He is. And it says, where two or three agree on anything that's touching this earth, it would be done. Don't leave out of here without taking advantage of what's here. You say, well, Cricket, I'll do it next week. Not every moment's the same. The Bible says that they went to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. They were in a room, and when they were in that room, it says that the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, blew in there. And He's never done it like that since. This may not be another day that you can get God moving on your behalf. Don't miss these moments. The presence of God is here. I feel it. I'm about to cry. I cry when I have a baby when I get the presence of God. But... I can feel it. All of you say, Cricket, can you really feel it? Yes, you can feel the presence of God. Just like they felt the earthquake. They felt the heat of the fire. You can feel God, and He's all over this place. You say, well, Cricket, I don't feel it. That just means your sensitivity level has not been set to the right number yet. You take my word for it. He's here. Oh, can I tell you why? Real quick, can I tell you why? Um, I believe Aaron's rod got chosen. There were 11 that didn't, but there was one that did. You want me to tell you why I believe it? Because, see, I don't think Aaron knew how to get to God, and he wasn't a perfect man. As a matter of fact, to me, one of the greatest sins committed in the Bible was committed by Aaron. The Bible says that he orchestrated the uh, making of the golden calf. They came to him and said they wanted an idol, so he told them what to do to do it. And he created uh, probably one of the biggest sinners in the Bible. But yet God still caused life to flow. Why? I believe this. I don't believe Aaron knew how to get to God, but I believe he knew Moses did. So when you read from the time of the burning bush until the time that his rod sprung up, you found Aaron hanging out with Moses as much as he possibly could. He, you found him when they were in the Pharaoh's, in Pharaoh's thing, Aaron was with them. You found Moses every time, like when they were in a great battle and Moses was raising and worshiping, keeping his hands raised. You found 
Aaron standing right beside him, holding one of his arms up. If you don't know how to get to the presence of God, start running around with people that do. That you can evidently see that God has blessed him. And you're going to see that there will come a time when you may not have anything, you can't do anything to just lay before the presence of the Lord, but you will find yourself in it. Because we're two or three gathered. And two or three agree. So we're going to praise. Let's take three minutes. Let's create such an atmosphere that you can tangibly see, feel, and even smell the presence of God. Let's watch God do some miracles in here today. Amen. If you've got to go, you're dismissed. Because the presence of God only has value to those that see the value. But if you've got three minutes, let's invite him into this place. Go ahead, Miss Leah. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your living hope. Your presence. Tasted.